Thank you so much, first of all, to Pastor Matt and Pastor Mona for having me here and for Emmanuel for getting me the roti today. Hey, hey. Best friend, best friend, best friend for life. All you need to do is feed me and you have a friend. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much. Yes, we are like Insta best friends and we, we met online, so we want to say thank you. This is like online dating, gone right. Because most times you know how that goes. Um, Tinder. But um, yeah, we met on Instagram and it seemed to have worked out. And so I'm so excited about being here. You have a great, great um, leadership here. They're so genuine, so happy, so loving, so generous. And we just are so grateful to be here. So greetings from Arlington, Texas. Amen? Amen. Well, you may be seated. So I'll just get through some of the formalities and we're going to go into the word. You ready for the word tonight? You like the word? I'm, I'm like a word girl. You understand? I mean, like the word is a word. You understand? I mean, presence and word. Word and presence. Word and presence. I should have been born a seraphim. You know? Yeah, that's how I feel. So tomorrow... If you come to church, you'll hear a little bit more about this in the message. No, it's not your size, okay? It's for things to come. So this we have made by faith, and it's because I have a strong anointing to pray for barren women. So when you're believing for a baby, come ask me. Twins, triplets, what you want? <laughs> I believe. So we, we pray over these, we anoint these, and... Um, you know, we use this as a, a, a point of faith contact that you can believe for the baby to come. As of you saw, you saw in the announcements, the Warfare 101, Believe in Prayer and Warfare. I know there are lots of books on prayer and warfare, but one of the things I find out is in the middle of a fight, I cannot figure out what page 336 is. Okay, I need to know, like, what, what, what? You know, so practical things, like you can't fight a war with your eyes closed. Okay, so we're, we like to do these prayer circles and keep our eyes closed Well. No, watch and pray. Keep your eyes open. Don't see the enemy with your eyes closed. There's just some practical things, how to hold your own all night. Prayer meeting, your personal prayer meeting, your authority in Christ. And it just gets straight to it, like no fluff, right? That's why it's so skinny. <laughs> it's on a diet. And then, of course, the space between, Pastor Mona's book. Amen. And so it's a workbook as well, and I just finished doing the small group um, to it. But this was really the story about me waiting in between on one of the... Um, hardest things. It took me 10 years to, to receive what I was believing for, and I kept wondering. I want to ask myself, did I just have to wait? You know, because I was tired of people saying to me, you know, if God opened a door and he closed one, I was like, oh, so is it all really up to God? No, because if so, I don't need to do nothing. I just need to sit down here and just wait. So I wanted to know if the whole sovereignty of God was the only element in my waiting and if so, I could check out the process. I could sit down and just let him do what he's going to do. But how many of you know without faith it's impossible to please God? And we are not of those that shrink back because a just shall live by faith. Amen. All right, so that's that. You can get those at the um, bookstore. I'll be signing them. But ready for the word. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, say, won't she do it? I know they say, won't he do it? I'm like, won't she do it? So we always start with a confession for the Bible. All right, who, where's, who, who's the piano? You're the piano man? Okay, I'm kind of loud, so um, this soft music right here, we're going to switch it up. Just, just track with me. We're going to work together, right? Okay, I'm just saying, because you're going to bring me down here, and I'm going to try to bring you up here. So we're just going to establish our relationship right now. I'm loud. All right? All right, got it. Okay. Grab your Bible or your phone, you millennials. How do you have your phone up in the church when the Twitter and the text and all that coming through in here? You all know what a real Bible is? Let me introduce to you the Word of God. Okay? It's not an ancient text that you just put in a museum. It actually has pages. I want you to hear the sound. You may never have heard it before, but it's real. You see that? You see that? There's no text coming in this right here. No Instagram alert. Oh, no. No temptation. Just the Bible. I suggest you get you one. So grab it. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can be who it says I can be. And I can have what it says I can have. Today, I boldly declare, my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My ears are open. Now I better not go to sleep. 
I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that it's falling on good ground. I thank you that it's changing lives for the better. And I glorify you, God, because the enemy will not be able to steal the word that will be planted in the hearts of everyone today. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here sealing this work. Continue to prep us for the next level. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verses 8 through 9 says this. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I know, you know, we, we just met. We met at lunch today, the 12 of us that were there or so. So the rest of you don't know me, so we have to, like, get to know each other. Because see, you look at me and say, oh, look at this bright-skinned girl with a little straight hair. She don't know nothing. I already know. I already know. I get it all the time. She bougie. She up, stuck up. She up, you know. And so I decided, uh, let me just introduce myself to you. So you can not uh, fabricate in your mind so with some false criteria who I am so you can disqualify the word of God that comes through my mouth because of the shoes I'm wearing or the clothes I have on. So let's just establish. My name is Sarah. I'm born in Kingston, Jamaica, to entertainment parents. My father used to be the road manager for the great Bob Marley. Woo! No pirates yet today, Rabbi. We were <laughs> raised in a Rastafarian home. Rastafarian home, if you don't know about it. Haley Selassie, Rastafari. Ever living, ever faithful, ever true. Conquering land of the tribe of Judah, Lion Order. We were raised 12 tribe. So in the country that has the most churches per square mile than any other country in the world, I had never been to church. Yes, it's a Guinness Book of Records fact. But I was raised in the Rastafarian religion. And so um, my parents, you know, were in music and all that cool stuff. We used to grow weed in our own backyard. Took our family pictures with the weed. Yeah. With the blunt in our mouth. And yeah, pictures like at five, six, seven. Yeah, we took those family pictures. That's what we were proud of, that we had the weed of wisdom in our life. Oh, yes. Ah, what a wisdom. The only story I did know about Jesus was that um, God hated people. Yeah, because he had some kids named Adam and Eve one time, and they did wrong. And he just kind of excommunicated them out the, the garden and put some angels with some swords and banished them. So, whoa, don't want that God. You can keep him. That's the only story I knew about God. So God was very big and very cruel, and so I didn't want nothing to do with him. I would just deal with Rastafari. So even going through that then, um, when I was about six, my parents decided to divorce. They were very volatile one to the other. I didn't quite understand why they were volatile till later on, but they divorced. But I hated my mom. That, uh, that was sure. I hated her. I know I had to go live with her, and I hated that I had to live with her because she used to beat me all the time. So... And we don't mean beat like whoop like here, like a belt. No, like grab your head, hit it against a ceramic sink beat, like beat, like beat, beat, like beat, like cut your skin with a belt beat, you know, that kind of beat. So I want to be with her, and I just couldn't w wait in my mind until I could grow tall enough to I could kill her. That was my plan. Get tall enough, and one day if she tried to beat you, you just kill her. This was my heart. Again, I am not saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, or fire baptized. I am a sinner. This is how sinners think. I'm just telling you, those of you who have not been in there one in a while, this is how they think. I see too much times we're often around Christians. We don't expand the church. We want to take people from other churches into our church when we need to go to the lost. But we don't know how to relate to the lost because we forgot we were lost ourselves. So we want to go talk to the lost with, hallelujah, blessed, highly favor. We don't know that language. So I did not know anything. I um, ended up... Uh, my first time being molested was uh, the neighbors next door. I was about um, eight years old, and there was an older boy, about 14. The second time was a girl. She was about 12. I was about eight. The third time was a group of boys. The fourth time was a gang rape. The fifth time was an uncle. The sixth time was a friend of my father's. The seventh time was a boy I didn't know. It kept going on and on. Sexual assault, sexual molestation, given pills by leadership and woke up and I know what was happening to me. So yeah, that happened and then I ran away from home when I was 13 years old because I couldn't deal with them, the parents, the people, the life. 
So I ran away from home, and that was when I no nearly got gang raped. And um, about I escaped that, and I went to a church. Somebody invited me to a church. He kept inviting me to this church, and I'd never been to a church. Like I told you, I used to mock the Christians and tell them, you can keep your God. I will stay with Satan. Satan and me were cool because your God makes you look very horrible. He doesn't take care of you. You look awful. And frankly, you have no mercy, no grace, no nothing. Keep your God. I will go to hell, and I'm clear I'm going to hell, and I'm choosing hell. That's what I'm doing. So I didn't really care, and so I um, ended up, uh, my mom found me in a club, and I ended up having to go live with her. I didn't like, quite understand yet. Now I'm about 14, 13, going 14. And this girl next door keeps inviting me to church. And so when she invites me to church, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't do that play. I don't, <laughs> I don't church. And so she said, keep going. And so she got me on my pride. You know, she was like, what do you have to lose? And it was like a deer. You know, when somebody dare you? I was like, you can't dare me. I'm like not afraid of nothing. And so I went to the church. And what happened at the church? I sat in the back of the church, in the dark of the church. In my, I had to borrow church clothes from her because all I had was club hall clothes, you know, drop it like it's hot clothes. That's all I had. Bump and grind, wine, wine. That's all I had. Dirty wine clothes. That's all I had. I didn't have church clothes. I don't know y'all don't know about that, but it's okay. It's okay. I'm like Paul, chief sinner. <laughs> and so I didn't know about any of that. And so I had to borrow her clothes. But I had my friends hooking me up on Friday night. They were going to pick me up. And then I was going to take off her little church clothes and go do what I normally would do on a Friday night. And yes, yeah, so I was in the club. I was smoking. I was carrying on, doing all that stuff. And I went to church. And the man was preaching John 3.16. Of all the things he decided to preach. For God so loved. Love? God love? No, God hates his people. Remember? God drives them out when they do wrong. God's scary. It's like God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. What? That whosoever, I'm a whosoever, believe could have everlasting life. And he said, it doesn't matter where you are or what you've done. God loves you. Well, by that time, I mean, I had done more things than most 30-year-old people I know. Because the unbeknownst to me at that time, I found out a year later, so why my mom was so aggressive and why she was so antagonistic and why we would fight so much and she and I would just, I mean, I have a picture when I was 12 and she just cut my hair off because I was disobedient and just, just took scissors and chopped it off for no reason. I mean, I'm like, what, what, why? I don't know if you've ever been in one of those things and you go, why? Now I found out she was on crack and she was a crack addict for 15 years. And so she used to cook the crack. I remember smelling it. I remember the pipes. I remember all of it. Now it made sense. Started making a lot of sense. And it made lots of sense while I was in the front of the hotel room while she was tricking in the back. It made sense. So this kind of life that I was living. And why, why? Why me of all the people? And so here I am, famous family in Jamaica, extremely famous, mega, uber famous family. And we can't say nothing because we got to cover up. So we have no lights, we have no water, I'm stealing food from the grocery store to feed my little siblings and I can't say nothing. So you see, I'm not coming to testify to you about a God I don't know. I'm not coming to testify to you about a place I've never been. I'm not testifying about you on somebody else's testimony. I'm telling you something that's real and something that's true, that God is faithful and that he's able. And if you're in the middle of the press right now, I'm coming to encourage you. Because God told me some of you have been pressed on every side, that you thought 2020 was going to be a little bit different, that you all got your New Year's party and vows and things in, and you did your vision boards and all that kind of stuff, and now you're in the middle of March, and you're wondering, what happened? Where's my 2020? Where's my double? Where's my clear vision? And it seems like things are going in reverse when they really should be increasing, and I've come to encourage you today that won't she do it? Won't she do what? Won't she make it through the press? Won't you make it through the press? You say, I don't know. I don't know if you're like me with God. I'm very honest with God. I mean, you know, things happen. I'll be like, you can pick somebody else. I mean, there's nobody else in this whole world you could pick. You, why, 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 why? Why you want me? Why you want me to go through this? Like, yo, like, hey, six, whole, six billion other people, you could pick somebody else, though. I mean, I'm just saying, like, you sleep on me. I've been praying and fasting and fasting and praying and praying. I've been faithful. I've been in the church. You know, I'm giving my life to you. And like, yo, give me a break. Can I just breathe? 
I feel like sometimes why one war ends, another one starts up, and I'm thinking, like, I'm no Navy SEAL, man. I ain't trained for this. I ain't trained for this kind of stuff. You know, can you not find another way? Can you not give me a shortcut? Can't you give me, like, cliff notes, something? Like warfare for dummies or something. Just get me through this fast. So I don't know if you're like you, me, but, you know, I, I just don't want to know sometimes why I have to deal with foolishness. Like, I'd be like, Lord, just deliver me from foolish people and foolishness. I mean, just, 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 ooh, rubber shunda, hey. You know? But I realized that, you know, there's somebody else that had to be in the press. This Jesus man, you know, this Jesus character, this Jesus son of God, this, this Jesus that we serve. Matthew 26. Matthew 26 says this, verse 36. Then Jesus, I've been stuck in Matthew 26 for like a month and a half, like no joke. Like every sermon has been from this, for real. Because I get so much revelation from this. You should read it. Matthew 26. Then Jesus came. This is verse 36. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And said to his disciples. I love this. Sit here while I go over there and pray. You ever going through and need somebody to help you? You ever going through and need somebody to come with you? Mm. So he, G Jesus needed some help too. You see that's what, that's what we don't realize. We think because Jesus was the son of God. That he didn't experience things like we did. He was trying to get his crew to come with him and help him. Stand with him. Pray with him. Support him. And he brought them along. Verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, and began to be grieved and distressed. Grieved and distressed. Grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul, he's speaking to them. And he says, my soul is deeply grieved. To the point of death. I'm going through, y'all. I'm struggling. I don't think I'm going to make this. Remain here and just stay with me. Watch with me. Keep me for a second. Hold me up. I've been doing this for you all this time. I've been in the trenches with you, Peter. Remember when your mother was sick? I raised her up from fever. Man, I've been here. I called you out. You were rejected from the whole school of being rabbis. No, you had to go be in your father's business and, and become fishermen and tax collectors and so forth. And what did I do? I gave you a place. I, as a rabbi, validated you. I brought you up and all I'm asking you, I'm telling you, my soul is grieved. I'm going through. I'm in a press. Keep watch. And he went a little bit beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you, you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Sleeping on Jesus. We don't want Jesus sleep on us, though, yo. Huh? Okay. We want those microwave prayers. We want to pray right now and ab abracadam, you know, shoes or shalazam, whatever you all do. And boom, there it comes. But when we, Jesus needs us, we have a reason why we can't. So the Lord said, reach out to your sister. The Lord says, give that. The Lord says, do that. And we're like, my eyes are heavy. What did you say? I can't hear. Say it again. But when we pray, we want him to come quick, fast, and in a hurry. Mm. And Jesus found them sleeping. And he left them again and went away for a third time. Jesus must have been going through. He kept going back and trying to get some courage. And he said, whoo. He's in the press. He's in the press. And then he comes back and says, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hand of sinners. They couldn't discern the time, you see, because they were concerned with just being around, but they weren't concerned about being in the presence. And many of us come around church, but we're never really in the presence. We just kind of part. You see, I was walking these aisles, you know, earlier on. And, and see, when it's time for worship, you have to understand it's an honor and an opportunity for us to come before a great God like him. 
who chose to put his spirit in broken ve vessels like us. So when you are in the presence of the Most High King, it is not befitting to check out. It is not befitting to see it as, oh, it's just, oh, let me see what the time is. You see, you never know when this time will pass again. You never know when the anointing that is right there will lift. You never know when something will move in your direction. And so if you passively sit by and let your eyes get heavy, you will miss the blessing in the press. You will miss the blessing of the presence because in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hands are pleasure forevermore. Some of you are going through the press and you need strength, but strength only comes in the presence because in his presence there's joy and the joy of the Lord is my strength. So if you need strength for the press, you need to be in the presence. Not spectating, participating. Jesus, Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane was located in the Kidron Valley. And the Kidron Valley, you know, that place was cleansed of idols three times historically. And God had said to them, cleanse it out. But it was also at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And it was surrounded by graves. So here it is, Jesus is in this place. This is the place that scapegoats used to be. They built a bridge and they would have to walk and carry the sins of the people out. Jesus is in this very significant place pressing place. This place is full of death. This place is full of blood. This place is full of sacrifice. This place is at the foot of the olive press. You see, I went to Israel and I saw the olive press for myself. And they had three pressings. You see, there's three pressings. And so, the first time they take the olives and, and they hand pick the olives and then the olives have to go in. And when they go into the press, there are two granite stones that are working against each other in opposite directions. And the weight of the stone is what's going to create the press. And as the olives are being beaten and battered and bruised and broken, the great thing about it is that it has to be done in the dark because the more light that comes into the oil, the less of the properties. And some of you are in the dark and you resent the dark, but certain things only grow at night. Like the jasmine flower only blooms at night. There's a certain fragrance that only comes at night. And some of you hate the dark because you think there's no growth in dark places. But how many of you know that the, the scientists tell you that you have to fall asleep with no lights on because that's when you grow most. And so you need to stop hating the dark and get your perspective switched about the dark and understand that you can grow in the dark just like you can grow in the light. You can grow in lean times just like you can grow in plenty times. You can grow in the valley just like you can grow in the mountaintop. It's just a matter of which God you're going to have revealed to you in the time of the press. If you're going to think that God has abandoned you and God has left you and he'll, the Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you, but if you believe a lie that he doesn't love you like somebody else, he doesn't favor you like somebody else, if you, com if you compare your timeline to somebody else's, your stories to somebody else's, your likes to somebody else's, if that is where you are, you're going to compare your God to somebody else's. And you're going to think that God is not showing up for you. So Jesus is in the press and he takes Peter. I love this, that he took Peter in there into the press because, you see, Peter was going to go through his own press and Jesus was trying to show him how to handle the press. But his eyes were heavy. So I'm coming to tell you today how to handle the press because I've been pressed. I've been depressed, oppressed, possessed, all of them. Est. Okay, all of them. When I was 16 years old, they sat on me, four people, and casted out maybe seven or eight demonic spirits out of my life. Perversity, witchcraft, fear, addiction. This stuff is real. We're not, we not playing around here. Yeah. So here it is. Jesus says to, to, to Peter at the last supper, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to press you. He's asked to sift you, add some pressure to you. But I've prayed for you that your faith may be strong. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, look, <laughs> I ride a die though. I'm going to go with you to prison and to death. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. And Jesus was like, Peter, listen to your son. Child, you don't even know what you're asking for. Before the rooster crows, You'll deny me three, night, three times. So my point for you tonight is <laughs> your purpose attracts a certain type of press. Your particular purpose and calling in God attracts a certain type of press. You see, David was a king, right? He was in the shepherd 
in the sheepfold, and his anointing attracted Goliath. Esther was called to be a queen, and her anointing attracted Haman. Moses was called to be a deliverer, and his anointing attracted the Red Sea. <laughs> you look over here at Joseph. He was called to be a governor, and his anointing attracted the prison. All through the Bible, you see that anointings and callings have attracted a certain press. And when you and I don't recognize a press and the pressure is for our good and to fortify and build us, we will resent it and become discouraged in it and we will acquiesce our faith to the pressure instead of changing the situation by our faith. You see, we will begin to go backwards and backwards and backwards because we are wanting to, we are just adjusting to survive. We come into the survival mode, not understanding by little by little. We are pulling back because we don't understand the the very blessing and benefit of the press. You got to be pressed. You got to be pressed. You cannot develop muscles without resistance. A ship cannot go forward without sails that are resisting the wind. You cannot grow in God without resistance and pressure and press. But we don't want that. But how are you going to get that next level of maturity if you cannot pass this level of press? Mm. Number two, the press happens in the dark. Nobody going to see it. As a matter of fact, sometimes you're going to feel, I mean, you're going to be like Jesus. You, you're around people and they still can't recognize it. They sleep on you. But you want all your friends to see you. In your press. You want all your friends to come and cheer you up and feel sorry for you and encourage you and all of that. And so you know what we do? These moping pity parties, we start sulking, drop our eyes so people can notice. And we want to manipulate compassion. But there's a certain times that you got to go through it by yourself. Because there's a revelation of God you need by yourself. And when you go into the wilderness by yourself, there's some things that you learn. You learn that God is Father. You learn that God is Healer. You learn that God is Deliverer. You learn that God will walk beside you. You learn that God is a small voice. You learn that God is the wheel in the middle of a wheel. You learn that God will make crooked ways straight and high places low. You learn that God is strong and he's a present help in times of trouble. Sometimes you got to go by yourself. You want too much company and you want group therapy and you want a group relationship with Jesus Christ. But the Bible says it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And sometimes your press requires you to be pressed by yourself. So all this slumping of your shoulders and I don't know, I'm, how are you doing? I'm okay, but you're really craving attention. Maybe that's your press. Maybe God's trying to starve you. Of the attention of other people because you're too codependent on other people's approval of you, acceptance of you, affirmation of you, and affection for you. You cannot be by yourself. Therefore, you cannot get the next level blessing. Because some people you'll never leave. And some levels you got to leave them. David could never deal with Goliath until he had left the lunch with the people on the side. But had he not learned to be by himself, in the desert with the sheep, he could not have faced Goliath by himself. You all need too much company. You need to learn to be by yourself. It is, <laughs> when Jesus was in the wilderness, he shut down. He didn't have all these people, his contacts checking in on him. No. Because some things can only be revealed when you starve yourself from the approval of people. Because let me tell you something. Persecution is only effective to the need and degree that you need affirmation from somebody else. See, if you don't need the approval of that person, their persecution won't bother you. But somebody talking about you, oh, or somebody don't talk to you. How about that? They don't respond to your texts. Or respond a little dry. They didn't put full sentences. They did like TTYL or just a thumbs up. And now you're having a fit. We, our relationship changed. We used to be closer. And what? What? So? Move on. 
Move on, yo. But let me tell you something. You cannot get to the next level holding on to this one. You're trying to get affirmation from the wrong people. They can't change your life. No how. You're trying to hold on to somebody's approval who not even further than where you are. What kind of thing? What is that? You're not even required for my destiny trap because you're below my level. I'm supposed to be a blessing to you, a mentor you, and I'm trying to get you, you to mentor me. We're not even on the same level. Oh, you can say if you're arrogant, if you want to say it's arrogant, it don't bother me. I fought too many fights. I ain't going to cling to you, and you're, you're a baby fighter. I don't, you can't come to war with me. You ain't never seen a demon climb up. you never seen somebody slide up a wall, and you want to come into a warfare with me? And I'm going to hold on to you while I go to the next level? Uh, police? No. I'm trying to go take on Leviathan. You're still trying to deal with fear. You're still scared of what they say about you. I can't, you can't come with me. I've already beat that 10 seasons ago. You can come to my class, but you can't walk with me. I've leveled up. Some of you are not leveling up because you're still holding to the people who have leveled you down. You don't need approval from them. You don't need nothing from them. What you need from them, I need to know. One more person following you? Is that what it is? You don't want your 923 people to drop down to 922? Like for real, yo? The press, the press, the press has a purpose. So listen, your purpose attracts a press, but your press has a purpose. Your press has a purpose. Three things it does. It makes you praise God. <laughs> oh, my God. It was good, the Bible says in Psalm 119, that I was afflicted. It was good that I was afflicted, for then I obeyed your word. Oh, let me tell you something. Jesus knows sorrow, because sorrow sometimes her head hard. So I have to say, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to listen. My, my head hurt. Because, you know, they say a hard head make a what? Aye. So sometimes I'll be like, okay, Jesus, I hear you. I hear you. But it was good. Good. That I was afflicted. For then I obeyed your word. You get praise. The next thing is God gives you a platform out of your press. He gives you a platform, something to stand on. So you know that you know. See, nobody can <laughs> convince me that the Lord don't save. Nobody can convince me that the Lord don't heal. Nobody can convince me that the Lord is not a present help in trouble. There's some things you can't convince me of because I got one and one experience with the Lord. That when I went through that faith fight and came out on the other side and I can look and say, had it not been for the Lord on my side. Then I can look and say, he pulled me up from the mirey clay, put my feet on the rock to stay. When I can look back and I can say, oh yeah, it was good and pleasant that I dwelled in unity in the house of God. I planted my feet in the house. See, there's some fights I go back and you can't move me off of because I got personal testimony. I didn't borrow your testimony off of Google. I didn't make up somebody's story. No, this kind of thing. So no, when I go like Jacob had, he had Jacob had in Genesis this experience with God and he saw angels and ascending and descending. And the Bible says that he got hit in his hip and he got a limp. That limp gave him a platform because every time he had a limp and somebody saw him, and they said, what happened? He said, oh, I had an experience with God though. Let me tell you. See, <laughs> this right here, I need to keep this. So you can remember, I remember this God that I serve. And so some of you got to know that your press is going to cause you to praise him. But your press will also give you a platform, something to stand on. So when the next test comes, you can look back and say, but wait, I remember that somehow, even though I was molested by that girl, I know who I am. Even though the devil was trying to tell me, you don't know who you are, a girl molested you. I was like, yeah, but I had way more boys that molested me. Am I a boy too? Am I a girl too? See, see, I can go, but God brought me through this situation. And my identity is secure in him. And who he created me to be from the foundation of the world is who I am. If he called me male, he called me male. If he called me female, he called me female. Created he them. See, I am not confused no matter what happened to me. All the assaults and all the rapes and all of those did not impede my identity because my identity was never in my assault. It was in who has assigned me. So I can stand and I can say, yeah, he brought me through that. 
that level one. Then you can say, okay, well, he brought me through poverty. Level up. He brought me through hunger. Leveled up. See, you got to use your platform to stand on. When the next thing comes, you go, okay, the same God that was back then is the same God here. He is, he's not changed. The Bible says he's like, the Lord, I am the Lord. I changeth not. The next thing that your press has a purpose in his people. The oil is for people. You don't see all this olive oil and nobody using it. I mean, you're supposed to cook with it. Rub it on your head. You, it's very good for tanning oil. You put it in your hair. There's so many things you can do with olive oil. You drink it, clean your heart out, cardiovascular problems. You drink some olive oil, tip, 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 free tip. <laughs> it's for use. Your press is not just for pressure. Your press is for people. God will put people in your way that the strength from your press will end up lifting their depression because there's always a press going on. But are we going to uplift or are we going to go down? So Peter, Peter ends up denying Christ. He failed in the press. He failed in the press. He walked with Jesus and everything, and we're like, Peter should know better than that. So, us too? We know better than to curse out the person in the Walmart line? Okay, so we don't curse. Okay, that's what we don't do? Okay, let's just lie about that. All right, so <laughs> we don't curse about that. Okay, so what, what we do, though, what I do, let me just talk about what I do. So the person is slow in front. And I, I don't curse anymore. I used to be a very prolific cursor. You know, like beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I could string that thing like an orchestra. <laughs> oh, man. That was amazing. <laughs> but I don't curse anymore. I have left that life. Okay, so I don't curse anymore. So now what I do is I fuss with attitude. So the person is front and I'm like, <sighs> do you need me to get that for you? I take my little things and I move it up on the aisle. Like, take the little, you know, little bar. Woo, man. Oh, can I help? When in my head, if I was a cuss, I'd have been like, move your. All of you who are cussers just went there. See, I didn't go, though. I didn't go. I'm holy. <laughs> I was like, move your hallelujahs. That's what I thought. <laughs> In the press, in the press, some of us fail in the press. But Jesus is so good. In John 21, he came back to Peter and he said, Peter, you love me? It's after he dead and raised up from the dead and stuff. He's like, you love me? He's like, Lord, you know I love you. He will not want to talk to Jesus. He was like feeling so bad. You remember, Peter felt so bad. That's the thing. It's when we mess up, just repent. Repent. And he was like, Peter, do you love me? He go, I love you, man. I mean, I, you, I, you know, I see it. I mean, I out here fishing and things, you know, just trying to do me. But you raised from the dead and all that stuff. I mean, I don't feel, I don't feel as powerful as you feel right now. I mean, we can still keep having this conversation, but I'm just going to scale these fish, and that's all I do. He said, Peter, Peter, you love me? He go, you should know by now. Hello, I mean, I don't know what you want from me. I've answered you twice. I love you, 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 I love you. He's like, feed my sheep. He was giving Peter another chance and saying, Peter, remember you are the rock. You're not your failure. You're not, you're not that, that, that situation you had in the press. That's not who you are. I'm reminding you of my purpose. Re I sent the press. The press was there. But it has a purpose. You got to go back and feed some people, Peter. You got to go back and strengthen those people I told you about. And by the way, Peter, you're going to die just like me because you said you wanted to die. But you're going to die upside down, hey. I showed you how to get through the press. You see, God reminds him of who he is. God reminds Peter, you can do it. You can get through this. Why? Not because of who you are, Peter, but because of who I am. Not because of what you've done, but because of what I just finished doing. You see, you and I can get to where we need to go, get to. Not because of our frailty, but because of our faith. Not because of our weakness, but because of the wins we have in him. So, how do you do this? How do you do this? Somebody needs your oil. How are you going to get through the press? Let me tell you how you're going to get through this press. Let me tell you how I get through the press. Because, 
I tell you, I've had some fights. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, I used to live down in this place uh, called Trenchtown, and my mom was on crack. <coughs> First Street. You can't get no more ghetto than that, trust me. So I just feel like, because I'm from there, I can't lose. There's nowhere lower to go than Trenchtown. There's nowhere more dangerous to live than Trenchtown. Machine guns every night, all night, papa, you know, living with the duns and stuff like that. So I figure, like, you know, God, it was good that I went through that because I ain't never scared. I've never been a scared person. Not of a fight. Not scared of roaches. I don't like frogs. I hate snakes. But people, oh, I'll come after you. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to test me on the parking lot? <laughs> Sign a waiver. Let's go. <laughs> now we going to see what you do with your yellow self. That's all. There's some African up in here. About 32%. <laughs> How are you going to get through the press? How are you going to get through the press? How are you going to get through the press? you got to, first of all, change your perspective. It is not going to kill you. You're not going to die. You are not going to die. Okay, you're going to make it. You're going to make it, and you're going to make it well, and you're going to make it big. Even if you got a limp, you're going to make it, and you're not going to be by yourself. You're not going to be alone. When you come out on the other side, God is there because the devil is trying to trick you. Let me tell you something. I learned this from a witch doctor friend. Yes, I have a friend who was a witch doctor. Why me? And he said, you know, when we would try to cast spells on Christians, you know, but we talking about how you're going to get, I want to know how do you time travel and go into people's rooms and how do you show up? I mean, these are questions I ask. I don't know if you ask those of your friends, but I ask those questions. <laughs> like when I feel this presence and somebody choking me, you ever had them demons choke you and try and rape you? No? Okay. You know, or um, visit you and you can't breathe and stuff like that. I've had all of those. So I need to know how not to have any of them visit me. So if you are having that, I'm going to tell you, because I know you don't want to raise your hand up in here because you think everybody think you're crazy. I understand. I get it. So what you're going to do, you're going to go to your bed. Before, before when you go to bed tonight, you're going to tell, tell them what to do. You're going to go to your bed and you're going to say, listen here, I'm not playing with you tonight. You can't visit me here. This don't belong to you. The blood of Jesus covers this place. It seals this door. I need you to get out. And you don't come back in here. Okay, this is my bed. This is my room. This is my space. You, know, you don't have no rule or authority or jurisdiction here. So I'm going to tell you, from this day forth, he shall give me good sleep. Because that's what the Bible says. He gives his beloved good sleep. So don't interrupt my sleep. If you want to sit over in the corner, you can do what you want to do. But you're not going to interrupt my sleep. That's not what you're doing tonight. Okay? You see like how your boss run your little children or your dogs? Come here and you say, sit. That's what you do to demons. That's all you do. You tell them what to do. They don't run you. You run them. I run things. Things don't run me. That's how it goes. So here's, how, here's, here's what you do. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Here's what's happening. So he said Christians do not know that they cannot really be touched. Now once they're under the blood of Jesus Christ, we really have no rights to them. So what we do is create circumstances to get them to agree with the circumstance. And then they do it by themselves. And once they come into agreement with the circumstance and their faith is off, then we create more circumstances. But we cannot directly impede them. We cannot directly touch them because they're under the blood. But what we can do is wait for them to give us permission to keep stirring up things in their life. So, the only thing that's going to counteract your press keep you floating in the press is the blood of Jesus and the word of God. Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. The word of God. So you see, when something comes your way in the press, you got, you got, a, you got a word up. You got a word up. But you know what? We don't know the word enough to word up. 
If I call your name today, and, I, and your name is Lisa, or Lisa. <clears throat> is there a Lisa or Lisa here that spells it L-E-I-S-A? Lisa or Lisa. So if that's your name, and I say Lisa, you're going to answer yes, because it's your name. Because you've heard your name enough to believe it's your name. So how is it that we don't know enough word to answer that situation? So that situation don't know its name. That situation is not responding because it don't call enough. You understand? Okay, for example, for example, for example. All right, you have a financial situation. Okay, your car need a tire. You weren't prepared for that six or seven dollars. That six or seven dollars is a big six or seven dollars. When you listen, when you live in tight, six or seven is lots of dollars. Okay. Then they talk about you know how they do at the little tire place. Oh, the thread on your tire is going to you're going to skid tomorrow. You have like a whole another year, but they want you to change all four tires. So nearly little six or seven dollars went up to three hundred and eighty-seven dollars. Oh, and you know what? You need the warranty on the tires. So now you have six hundred dollars, and you're like, I just, I just, I just wanted half a tire. I just want you to go in there, inflate it, and seal it. <laughs> and so now, your little mind, so the devil, now we talk about the devil, and he comes to you in the press, because now you're being pressed, you understand? Know your money being pressed. Your money being pressed, and the devil say, huh, Friday's payday. That tithe is $67 too, isn't it? Mm. And you say, yeah, the tithe is $67. Press. You're being pressed. And you think, well, I catch the tithe on the next round. Well, okay. Brave heart. <laughs> Y'all funny with the tithe. I'd be scared of God with the tithe. But yeah, so you 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 thinking in your pocket, you think it's six or seven dollars. And so now you're being pressed. You're being pressed. You're being pressed. And uh, you have a choice. You have a choice now to adjust your faith to the level of your circumstance. So I use this example, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is real stuff now. See, I feel like because we're Insta friend, family already, like, like we're best friends, I'm going to talk to you like we're talking to my church, okay? All right, so here, here this is what happened. Let me, just, let me just sit down and tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. <laughs> Whew. So girl, let me tell you what happened. So you got your six or seven dollars. <laughs> and uh, you decide that you don't want to give your six or seven dollars to the tithe because you got to pay for that car tire. So now, by an act of my faith, I am saying to God, I don't trust you. <clears throat> so that $670 that you made that week, that you were giving your $67 off, you said, well, you know, I feel bad I didn't give the $67, so I'm going to drop God $5. You say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, God, I'm going to catch you on the next round. I'm going to give him a $5 from a tithe. You even put tithe on there. <laughs> no, because you think you're slick. It's okay, you can fool us. I mean, you know, hey. But guess what happened now? You, by an act of your faith, have put $5 in the tithe, telling God, hey, I need a $50 paycheck, not a $670 one, because I can be trusted at the $50 level, because you got $5 in tithe. So when they lay your behind off your job, and now you get $50, I don't know why you're mad. Because by an act of your faith, you kept drawing back and not trusting God and saying, God, this is your principle. This is your unequivocal way for a financial increase. I am going to stand and say, listen, when the devil is coming at me and saying, oh, you need to pay that thing. I go, oh, no, there's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. The Bible says, if I give, I shall be blessed. Given, uh, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I can say, listen, Lord, I am a giver, and I have a harvest. No, I will not go back on my word in my financial giving because I'm a word up. I got enough word to say I know that what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, that because I have purpose in my heart that he gives seed to the sower, that he will also give it to me, right? That I can give at whatever thing I want to give. That's what it says. So now when the temptation is coming to me, I can word up. When the doctor comes and says, hey, listen, your tubes don't work. You're, you got the fibroids. You got endometriosis. You got breast cancer. You got uterine cancer. You have goiter. You have diabetes. You have high blood pressure. I can either just acquiesce to that or I can say, hold up. 
whole up. Exodus says, you bless my bread and my water and you remove all sickness from me. Psalm 91 says, no sickness will come near my dwelling place. Oh, over there in Exodus, it also tells me that you are Jehovah, Rapha, the Lord who heals me. Your word says that you will put healing in the water. Till children's bread, healing is mine. I will not back up off of this confession. I am not going to come and agree with you about my sickness. I will work with you with your limited knowledge, but I'm going to the infinite God and I'm going to apply the word. Word. Oh, and then he comes to you and says, oh, your family, oh, they're not going to get saved. Oh, your children won't ever turn on. See, I just came through a faith fight with my daughter. Oh, I know this daughter kind of situation here. And you see everything going in the opposite direction. And I say, oh, no, God, you made a promise to me that my children will sit around the table like olive plants. You said the righteous will leave an inheritance for their children's children. You said that my quiver will be full of children. You said that I will be blessed coming in and I will be blessed going out. You said in Joshua to my whole house will serve the Lord. Oh no, devil, you don't get my kid. You can get somebody else's kid, but this kid here has been dedicated. Like Hannah dedicated Samuel, I dedicated this baby before she was born. I call that she was, she was dedicated before the womb, that you knew her, and she's fearfully and wonderfully made. I declare and I decree over her, nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lost. I call her out of darkness and into the light. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. Oh, you see, you gotta know the word. So he was coming for my kid, and I came right back at him. I said, keep messing with her. I'm going to lead more people to Jesus Christ this year than you ever seen. Keep playing with her. Oh, and then he may come after you with your marriage. Oh, and you want to stab him. Oh, yes. And you have to declare and say, this is a man of God. He's like Samuel. He's like the prophet. None of his words will fall to the ground. Oh, and I'm like those women. I'm like the proverb 31 woman who is respected in the city gates. You see, you got to know the word. And they're on your job and they're hating on you. And they're lying on you and they're setting you up. And they're overlooking you. And you got to say, oh, but Psalm 5 verse 12 says, he surrounds the righteous with favor like a shield. And we are more than conquerors through them in Christ Jesus. Because you see, when Jesus was in the press, the Bible says in Philippians that he pressed towards a mark. He knew what was before him. And I just want to encourage you tonight that your press has a purpose. But you got to keep going through the press. And when you're going through, you got to word up. You can't know more about your complaint and more about the situation than you know about the word. You need to know more verses than you know your name. Your word got to come out to you. The word got to be inside of you. The word got to surround you. The word got to wrap you up. You got to challenge yourself. You got to learn a scripture every single day. Don't be lazy with the word. By every week, you should know seven to ten scriptures. You're all joking with the word. You meditate. The Bible says meditate on this. Oh, you know why this is so important? The Bible says that angels hearken to the word. Angels hearken unto the word. You want angelic deliverance, angelic interference, angelic intervention. You got to know this word. So when you're in the press, you got to press back with the word. Oh, you got to press. I don't know who is out here, but it's like you are like the woman in the issue of blood and you, you're pressing your way, but you're not pressing in faith. You just keep trying in your own circumstance. But I want to encourage you. You got to sit down and incubate yourself. Oh, I remember sitting there believing for my daughter. Locked up one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, praying, 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 fighting off devils, fighting off demons, resisting, resisting, saying, no, this is not going to be the end. This is just a comma in her story. I moved the period from this chapter and I rewrite a new chapter for her. Oh, oh, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we stand up with our authority.
authority. And you said, God, that we will trample on serpents. And we'll trample on all power of the enemy. And in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, I rebuke you. I confuse your wisdom tables. I bring all your work to naught in the name of Jesus. Lose the people of God. Oh, Father, thank you that you're sending ring angels and you're encircling us around God and you're putting them in links and arms around our property, around our family, around our purpose, around our call, around our relationship. Oh, Spirit of fear, I cast you out in the name of Jesus. Spirit of struggle and stress and poverty and disease and sickness, I call you out in the name of Jesus. Oh, I rebuke you. Cancer, lymphoma. Oh, in the name of Jesus. I command crooked backs to be made straight now in the name of Jesus. I command inflammation in the body to be gone. Oh, I command back problems to be relieved. Back problems in the lower L4, L5 area to be relieved in the name of Jesus. Cataracts go in Jesus' name. Deafness, I command you to be relieved in Jesus' name. Torment be loosed in Jesus' name. I command peaceful sleep, 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 peaceful sleep. Worry and anxiety to be gone in Jesus' name. Torment, I command you out this place. And I declare freedom in this place. I declare the spirit of liberty in this place. here and you have a you are dealing with like a, a chronic disease that the doctor has talked about and you don't you can, they can't fix it I need you to come real quickly let's pray for you I'm not talking to dealing with no coronavirus you got faith for that you don't even need to worry about that you ain't dying I, the word says I shall live and not die I will declare the works of the Lord I ain't scared of no coronavirus. My assignment's not done. It can't take me out. Nothing can take me out until my assignment is done. That's what you gotta know. If you're here and your hips are uneven, meaning one leg is shorter than the other, can you come to this side? Some of you walk with a slight limp. Is that you? Just come up there real quickly.
God, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we want to give you the opportunity to do that tonight. We won't embarrass you or ask you to come up here, but I do want to ask you by simply raising your hand to let us know that we can pray with you. Or if you need a good church home, you want to be baptized, or you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, today's a great day to do that. So if you would, I'm going to count to three. Again, I'm not going to ask you to come up here, but I do want to pray with you. If that's you, at the count of three, and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, accept Jesus Christ, join this amazing church, or be water baptized, I'm going to ask you to slip your hands up. One, two, three. Is there anybody here? Anyone here? I see a hand in the middle there. Anyone else? I see a hand over here. Anybody else? Okay, let's say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you my life. I believe. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. I now call him my Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, thank you so much for having me. God bless you. I will see you tomorrow. I'm not sure how to close this out.